Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm really excited to talk after Stan. Uh, first of all, he's a, a bit of a hero, so that's an honor. But also, I see a tremendous uh, synergy between the things we're going to be talking about. Um, and in many so Stan talked about work with pre-service elementary teachers, uh, and sort of that leads to perpetual problems. I'm going to talk about work with secondary teachers, and, and I'm going to try to offer a hypothesis for sort of the root cause. Of, of these phenomena, um, though I don't think I can support that claim fully. So we'll talk a little about what do I mean by mathematical maturity. We'll talk a little about my course. Uh, we'll analyze some evidence uh, of learning from the students. And then we'll come back and talk more explicitly about the implication uh, for teachers because of the theme of this session. So uh, many disciplines have a a term for thinking like the discipline. I think sociology, they call it sociological imagination, which is very colorful. But ours, we often call mathematical maturity. And it basically means a, the habit of approaching questions like, the member, like a member of the mathematical discipline, thinking about things mathematically. And sort of as a consequence of that, uh, it includes the habits of precision, uh, attending to detail, interpreting. But the, the one I'm going to focus on is interpreting ideas through the appropriate disciplinary epistemology. That we have a notion of what it means for something to be true in mathematics, what it means, no, it means to be shown. And I think that's a really important part of it. Um, and so the questions I have are, are my modern geometry students reaching an appropriate epistem epistemic stance? Do they make progress in mathematical maturity in my course? And if possible, if so, why? So pulling out from those questions, um, epistemic stance, what, what, what are they thinking about knowledge? Um, what, are, what would be appropriate? And what would progress look like? These are uh, hard, very hard questions. Fortunately, someone else did the work for me. Um, William Perry has a scheme for epistemological development. And this is a sort of a short version of it, uh, where it's regrouped into four main phases. The first is, uh, and, and they're different in terms of what it means, where knowledge comes from. So in dualism, knowledge is sort of absolute, and it comes from authority. And authorities know what's uh, true and what's false. And, and that's, what, that's sort of how you evaluate uh, knowledge. Multiplicity. Um, Instead, there are many authorities. Every perspective has authority over knowledge in its context. And they're sort of incomparable. Something can be true for someone else and true, not true for this person. And there's, just, there's no way to, to connect those. Uh, relativism, uh, described here as procedural knowledge, we have accepted ways of knowing. And so they're habits of, habits of mind. Often, this is what we're trying to teach at the college level, the kinds of argumentation that we accept from, from college thinkers. And uh, eventually, people realize that those arguments have to start somewhere. Uh, and you have to accept some things as true at the beginning of those arguments. And so they move to relativism with commitment, which I've called grounded knowledge. So it's still modes of argumentation, but where there's an awareness of the foundations. Um, I claim that uh, the growth, epistemological growth, is particularly and especially important for pre-service teachers. Uh, we'll talk more about this at the end when I have specific examples to refer to. But uh, in my department, the thing that separates the pre-service teachers uh, from the other math majors is that they see themselves as headed towards becoming an authority who says true, th true things at children as opposed to some hopefully more nuanced perspective uh, from other groups. And that's terribly unfair oversimplification of their perspective. But um, th they yearn for a time when math was just absolute, and they can go back to that just saying those true things to children a out of love and, and desire to help them. I'm, I'm not, I think that it's best of intentions. Um, and also, fortunately, in terms of the uh, progress, the research around uh, Perry's scheme also indicates some uh, experiences that are important for moving people forward, uh, which would be downwards, uh, in, the, uh, in the scheme. Encountering disagreement and the unknown, engaging the thinking of peers, and justifying claims and evaluating assumptions, which I think is a reasonable definition of IBL. Hence uh, the, my choice of using IBL in a lot of my courses. Um, so I'm talking about a modern geometry course. Geometry is an interesting position in our curriculum. Uh, in many ways, geometry purports to be talking about the universe, about the physical world. So it feels very absolute, like things could just be true, because we're talking about an object. But 
Um, these students in, at our institution, it, they're usually the end of their junior year. Many of them, it's their last proof-based math course. They take an intro to proof, a proof-based linear, abstract, and real. So this is, a, this is like, they really understand when we say math, we mean you're going to prove things. Um, so it's somewhere between procedural, the relativist, and uh, dualist, the sort of absolute knowledge. Uh, in this particular course, uh, it has been pretty small. I've been using David Clark's Euclid Euclidean Geometry book. I could talk for a couple of hours about what I think is awesome about this book. But in particular, it's uh, very amenable to, to pushing hard on the precision uh, of an axiomatic system, which is related to how something comes to be true. Um, so I like, it. I like the fact that it's coherent there. The basic course outline for what I do, <laughs> um, the people who know me well know that uh, like I, this is another five hours worth of things I could talk about. But um, the first seven weeks we do Euclidean geometry, IBL. That's a really short version. And the last three weeks um, we do other stuff. We encounter uh, hyperbolic geometry. It's more of an exploration-based approach as opposed to sort of the script uh, discovery-based. Um, and then we, we do some reflection where we, uh, we think about axiomatic systems. Um, Along the lines of things I said before, the IBL has a strong uh, emphasis on oral communication, and I want to balance that with writing. I want the students to evaluate the arguments. This is one of the three experiences. I want to evaluate a lot of arguments. I want them to see the thinking of their peers. And so I pair this work with uh, an, ac an activity that I call uh, a wiki textbook, in which they take David's skeleton of a textbook that has theorems and questions and transform it into a textbook filled with content. Um, and several of them have said that they intend to use this as a textbook in their future uh, high school classes. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, OK, so onwards to some evidence. Uh, and we're looking for the epistemological, what it means to be true, what is known kinds of themes. So there's a slightly odd image on this page. At, the, at this point, when we're proving this theorem, our definition of a right angle is an angle that is congruent to its supplement. We don't know anything about measure of angles at this time. And um, so we're trying to prove that an angle that is congruent to a right angle is also a right angle. Um, a, so we're given uh, that A and B are the congruent angles and that A is right. So you can see A is congruent to C here with the green swoops and that A is given, congruent to B. But B and D are drawn somewhat oddly, yes, given that, a, that B is going to end up being a right angle. And, um, it, and, it, and it, this, they're drawn in GeoGebra. And it takes some work to draw the picture this way as opposed to drawing it like a right angle. So the student has decided, I am specifically communicating with this picture that I do not yet know that D is congruent to B. The sort of like, sometimes I've heard of this described as the, the art of drawing figures so that you don't assume the thing that you're trying to prove. Um, so I think this is a really interesting example uh, of this. Um, but to some extent, I can hear my own voice coming through in these actions, some things that I've sort of suggested and, and pushed them on. Um, so moving from something that an individual student wrote to something that the, the class as a whole wrote, this comes from the foreword uh, of, the, of the wiki textbook. This is. Um, most of the, for, well, not most, it's about a third of the forward. Um, the emphasis is mine to, to highlight the epistemological points, but the majority of what we hold to be true in any given mathematical system comes from a proof, generally called a theorem. But there is so much more to a system than that, as you, than that, as you will so, soon learn. The axioms, or basic assumptions within the system, are universally known propositions that are used without proof. An axiom is a premise or starting point of reasoning. We can think of an axiom as being so evident that it is accepted as true without controversy. An axiom is a proposition that is not and cannot be proven within the system that is based upon them. We get these intuitions from a priori knowledge or experiential belief. That is, all, that is really all mathematical truth is. The deductions we reach from objects we already know or assume to be true. Uh, I, I, think this is, I think of this as a sort of prototypical relativism with commitment kind of writing where they say everything's derived from these foundational assumptions and there's some concern about how do we know those basic assumptions. The, the parenthetical point at the end is actually kind of telling. Um, many of them loved Kant's synthetic a priori truths in which just, we could just start to know things to be true about the world and so that the axioms could be true in some 
ab some real absolute sense, and the rest of them were fine, uh, like I am, with a more relative uh, notion of the truth. So that's what the know or assume represents. So um, I think this is really nice. These are both uh, end products to show that they got to something that I think is an interesting perspective on how we, what we know at a given time. Um, one of the other things I did was a comparative uh, piece of data. I, uh, they built some concept maps on the first day of class and on the last day of class about the nature of mathematical truth. Um, if you can't tell, I really like this stuff. And um, we, yeah, so we did it. Um, so I want to show you uh, a pre and a post for one particular student. Can you guys see that? Yeah, that looks good. Um, so this is a pretty procedural one. Mathematical truth introduces undefined terms, definitions, and examples, which provide intuitions, decidability, logic that are needed uh, for construction. Uh, they're needed to test, um, which articulates contradiction. They're needed for evaluation, which shows consistency, which cre creates deduction. I don't understand that one. Producing theorems, lemmas, and axioms. Um, so there's a couple of worrisome things here. <laughs> Um, it, I mean, it's not unreasonable description uh, from some perspectives, but uh, the one that worries me the most is that axioms are the same as theorems and lemmas. They're products as opposed to uh, inputs, right? There's, there's no differentiation between them. And this was a common theme. Um, now let's look at this student's post. So mathematical truth. First we have ideas. From these we assume definitions, intuitions, and axioms. And through logic, rigor, and persistence, we can use constructions and examples to make conjectures that uh, then we can apply a type of evaluation where we use deduction, contradiction, and decidability only to find out that we still have undefined terms. So we test yet again and look for consistency uh, in our results. And if this is true, we have found theorems, corollaries, lemmas, and then we have proof that there is such a thing as a mathematical truth. Um, I think this is a beautiful description of the process of creating mathematics. Um, and it, and she's, it's the same student. She's fixed the issue with, lemma, with uh, axioms, right? At the very beginning, she says, we choose definitions and axioms. So she understands. Um, so this is a, this is a pre-post change. You can see that some, her understanding of those terms is actually different than it was before. And they'd heard the word axiom before in real analysis, so it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a new term. Um, heading back to uh, PowerPoint, or Beamer, uh, the students uh, compared their pre-posts and told me what they thought was different. They thought there were more detailed connections, more connections themselves and more complexity. Uh, they, they noticed that they distinguished between terms, so they noticed this phenomenon that I was worried about, uh, and that they noticed it was sort of more process-oriented or procedural, sort of about the nature of mathematics, uh, producing mathematics. And some of them noted how it became cyclic, how at the end it would sort of wrap back around and you'd start the process over, um, which is a nice way for them to think about how mathematics is produced. From my perspective, uh, the big things were the location of axioms and definitions, that they, in the end, they were appropriate, as opposed to axioms being this, a kind of theorem. Um, in the pre, there were a small number of right or wrong uh, arrows and many odd or vague ones that I didn't know how to interpret. And in the post, there were many right, many that made total sense um, and seemed appropriate, and a small number of right and wrong uh, items. And through the process, three different types of these uh, maps arose. This, I, I've labeled them psychological, procedural, and epistemological. The psychological ones had to do with uh, how one comes to believe mathematics or how one comes to learn mathematics, sort of the individual uh, mind. Uh, procedural is how mathematics is produced. So that's the one we saw was about sort of where the mathematics itself comes from. And then the third kind was the epistemological one, um, given the mathematics, how it comes to be true. Uh, but it turns out that they were all basically the same, that in some form, uh, axioms and definitions eventually power their way through to theorems. They're all basically the same, but there are three different uh, ways of focusing um, on this question, which I think is interesting. Um, I also asked the students if they thought they made any progress. Uh, these are two of the supplementary questions I wrote. Um, developing a clear 
uh, understanding of and commitment to the axiomatic method in mathematics as well as, as its limitations, and developing an, a nuanced understanding of the nature of mathematical truth. These are very abstract and very specific uh, learning outcomes, and they claimed uh, basically a four out of five, which represents substantial progress uh, on these items. So they believe that they made some progress in terms of their understanding of the nature of mathematical truth. Um, and so I have one, I always ask my students, in what way is the role of student in this class different from your other classes, and how has that affected, how have those differences, if any, affected you as a learner? Um, and I get some interesting responses, and here's one of my favorite ones from the last year. Uh, even in the other proof-based classes I have taken, it still very much felt like I was being dragged along 80 to 90% of the time. In this class, through the virtue of the pre-work, we get to at least attempt every proof in the book. Even if we didn't figure it out then, it was always one of us that got it eventually. We were never given anything on faith. We get to build everything ourselves. It was a pleasant transition from being taught to learning, which not only is it beautiful and articulate, it serves both as, uh, I think, a, a statement of uh, sort of where the knowledge comes from. It comes from, it's not coming from authority anymore, but it also serves in many ways as a definition of IBL. So this is one of my big claims for this talk, that IBL is set up to work on these beliefs about the nature of knowledge. Um, and so we'll finish with going back to my original claim. This uh, epistemological, epistemological growth is uh, especially important for teachers. So a teacher who is still dualist about mathematics cannot imagine asking the student to do anything other than memorize, because that's how they think knowledge is acquired, memorizing what an authority has dictated to them. Um, I don't think we have much of a problem with multiplicity uh, in, in math teachers, but I can imagine a teacher who would be uncomfortable comparing methods. Whereas in many ways, we have, as mathematicians, we have an aesthetic, we have, we have ways of saying this one's more elegant, this one's more powerful, this one's more generalizable. We have ways of saying one is bet more, well, better. And multiplicity would, would disallow that, which would be, could be a problem. Um, relativism is more uh, appropriate, uh, but it emphasizes these are the things we do, and it, and it can feel ungrounded. And the goal, I think, is for them to be in relativism with commitment. Sort of flipped, uh, coming back to, to Stan's talk, a student that comes out of a class with a, that, a dualist teacher might be frustrated that, um, that there's no room for, for questions. Right? I just, this is just the thing I have to know. There's no flexibility here. I'm done with math. A student who comes um, out of a, a multiplicitous class just, um, I don't know, that, that they could, well, there's, there's no comparing there. So again, I don't think that one's such a big problem. Um, the, a student who comes out of relativism, one of the problems is uh, feeling like they can never get a satisfactory answer out of the question, okay, why do we do that? And so I think each of these stages represents a common complaint we hear about the, the field of mathematics. And I don't actually think it's a claim about the field of mathematics. I think it's a claim about the epistemology, the, the beliefs their teachers hold about the nature of mathematical truth. And so I think moving this, the teachers forward on this is actually one of the things that will change the student's experience, which turns back into the cycle that Stan was working on. So thank you. Uh, I appreciate your attention. Technical question on the hyperbolic geometry. Uh -huh. Do you have a, a nice model that you use of either concrete disk or half plane that, in GeoGebra? Yeah, so we use GeoGebra for the, uh, um, the Euclidean geometry, so they're used to ruler and compass on a, on a computer. And then I give them it's a Java applet, non Euclid. Okay. Um, and it's, and it's harder, it's much less user friendly, but after being sort of experts in GeoGebra, they can handle, uh, they can handle my user. There are GeoGebra Concrete disk models, but oh. they're not very nice. Okay. So that's all right. The other question is, is there a distinction between the way we convince each other that the math that we've created is correct and from how we actually create the math in the first place? And it, is there a distinction there? And in, it doesn't appear that you, if there is a distinction, that you make that distinction. Um, I think there is a distinction, but I don't think that the distinction is 
particularly important for what's going on here. So my claim that there were three types of um, the good ones it didn't matter whether they were psychological, procedural, or epistemological uh, concept maps. They all had basically the same structure. It was the connecting words, whether it was um, I do this, so now I know this, or I do this, and so now this is true, or I do this, and that produces this. I'm thinking more of sort of like inductive experimentation, trying to, you know, a lot of random stuff that that mathematicians do before they ever, uh, you know, they make a conjecture and then they prove the conjecture is true and then they prove it's false and then they, and does, does that come across to your students at all? Um, or is that important? Yeah, I mean, I we discuss, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this in public, but um, I sort of jokingly said to them that I think science is tacky. Um, and what I meant by that, and they, we all knew it was a joke, and I don't really mean this, but is that in science they have to, they have to take data, and that, that that's a way of knowing for them, and it's a very different aesthetic, uh, or epistemology, if you like, uh, for us, that yes, it's part of the process. And in my other classes where I teach more uh, conjecture and, uh, and sort of research, it feels a lot more like a science course, but this one, um, we do that as a tool for generating ideas, but not as a, a way of knowing. So we talk about those things. I don't think I do a great job with that aspect.